This next fellow, gosh, um, I'm really in awe of this guy's talent. Uh, it, it's this old soul in this young picture's body. You're going to hear it when he recites uh, Michael Rose. Good evening, guys. Hello. My God, I can hear you. Good evening. <laughs> My God. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a few poems. I just finished a book this week. I'm going to uh -huh. read the, called The Rattles and Other Poems. I'm going to read The Rattles for you all, which is the title poem. And, um, and then another poem from that book, and then some new stuff that I wrote. All right. It's called The Rattles. You may have heard it before. Life rattles like the sun, sweet love. A million people run with the pace of infinity into the geometric blocks of time. And I envy them. I love them. I miss them. I am inspired by the rattle. It moves my bones. My skin rattles like my bones do. And I cannot help to but I weep over the many lives that I have chosen not to have. My life is beautiful, though. It rattles in different ways than most others. I am a lover to the sweet songs of ancient dreams, mystic dreams of bowing in the Tigris River life stream and shouting out to the good earth beneath the clouds of China. I rattle in the romantic heat of ancient drums, ancient love. I rattle so hard in my bones that my body need not leave Hopewell Junction. It need not flee. Indeed, my body is infinitely pointed at the sky. And I am quite certain sometimes, if only for the briefest glimpse of my own sweet and eternal awning, that I radiate loud with the moon. Nonetheless, I am in love with the rattle of possibility. Oh, it rattles. And my heart beats in the ancient sands of Spain, swings on the braids of time. I have not been there to Spain. I wonder, why am I so different, staying always? Why do I lead the beautiful life of the stayer? Isn't my heart too big? I stay precisely because I have always been infinitely contented by my bones, and my bones dream too far, and my heart quakes too big. This heart is too much to be able to leave itself without great efforts and pain, without the swift hand of a mother. Alas, my hope has always been that I love to stay because I am too big to move. But I love all of your momentum, my classmates. You move, and deeply, I love it. You swing, and your hearts swing, too, like pendulum clocks sat on the rim of the cosmic stir, breaching the borders of God and time. You are special, no, if you live in the city, and love in the ways of a child, drink in the demeanor of a babbling tower, and flower like golden poppies do, sitting in the field of eternity. You too, my love, my real love, are here with me flowering. You are my golden poppy. I think of you in every moment of infinity, and I wish that you loved me by the sun. I do. Drinking teardrops of solar moons into the eternity of my movements ticking at the vibrating edge of the Homeric ocean of long, infinite dreams, and peering into the gray abbey, my slow and broken heart. You, my dear, move within the rattle of life like a holy light in the basement of the world. I love the rattle like I love you. I love the rattle infinitely.
This next poem is called On New Year's Eve. She says that she is sorry. It is New Year's Eve. A woman is uttering in a low but audible voice that each of her iced coffees has been incorrectly mixed. The wife utters these woes to her husband, but she does so intentionally and loudly so that the clerk may hear. Like loose gravel, she mutters. In that way a freight truck delivers weather on the highway, she mutters. Upon this low-ranking instance of inhumanity, my eyes rise like miniature kingdoms, and I voice quietly into the ether of mine. Don't be sorry, please, sweet person. We here today are as well fed as the grasping fingers of yesterday were. For long we have been. I think how glad I am that we breathe, each of us, for tomorrow we may only manage a shallowest of most fallow gasps. I think to tell them. Let us break bread and fix the smallest of small mistakes, then. Why not burn the artifice of apology to the wintry soil, to instead build large towers of gratitude for everyone with little and with ample lamp oil? in the spiritual flight from today into tomorrow, from tomorrow into the past. One day, the man's wife will surely tour the building. In a more gracious moment of her being, she will tap her foot like a beatnik child, rhythmic, head to foot, musical all the way to the sun-beaten rooftop. For we breathe, we breathe, we breathe, dear woman. It was Dostoevsky who said of humankind that it was the most ungrateful of all species to ever go crack open palms towards the golden sun, the orb that draws us from our spiraling conch shells tucked quietly in the sweet orange wells of our mother's smallest bits of earth. In Sazen, the third patriarch, he whispered that preference and not desire is a lost, a lonely disease of the human mind. Tonight, from the ceiling, music flitters down into me, and I feel not in a cup like or unstreet like. Indeed, the cafe saunters. Flowers will rise in three months, I consider. Yes. Dirt will fall from crawling stems and bouncing leaves, like friendly comets padding the mountaintops of ants. The dancing specks will travel like slinking alley cats deep into the human palm lines and under human nails. Flower heads will tilt like fields of satellites towards the sky-bound sun. And then, as I recall, as I dutifully recall, Smiles, as always, will litter the earth like a holy spectacle of human lights. Um, I'll read something new for you guys. Let's see. Hmm. Okay, I'll read this. So this is a uh, meditation on my dog and, uh, and also a meditation on uh, an atman, which is, um, I believe that's the Sanskrit word for non-self, the Buddhist notion of non-self, an atman. Okay. It's called Loki because my dog's name is Loki. Today I saw the god of mischief hanging Indra's net between the trees. My friend, the wonderful wolf, who drifts in and out of my world like a moon these days. As he sniffs the borders of the grass, he shimmers like a fish's wiggly tail near a boat in the shallows of a sun-beaten body of water, reflects an elfish-like glow in the mists of a dimly lit forest. I think for a moment how the light of the world must drift into one's life like a quivering wind, like an ethereal ghost, 
how it must call like a fire on a mountaintop calls to an army, like a king calls out to the earth. The trees bent down to rustle the child Gotama's hair, it is said. Do you believe this happened, dear reader? Tell me. I believe it. I believe living magic will drift into our lives like the bodies of gods drift onto the shores of the earth. I believe the light of the world is not found in our deductions, therefore. It is not felt with the hands of our beliefs or the fossilized figures in the swimming twilight of the dusk. It arrives like a soft footprint in the grass. The meadow of our self is no meadow, no meadow at all. The body of our self is a figure that emerges from the swamp and retreats from the surface of the truth. Or is that mere poetry, the kind that Socrates guards us from? Alas, there is no meadow or swamp, because there are no objects in the world. There is no possibility for a self, never has been. The glow of a light is only had in time, I hope you see. Time means the end of all objects. The butterfly's wings do not flap and move the wind. The wind does not flap and move the wing. The mind, the wing, the wind, the world move together. Thank you. Young me, too. Gosh, Michael. Great stuff. Thank you. <laughs>